Thanks, thanks, Paul. Yeah, um, my name's Tim Middleton. I'm a software engineer with Coherence. I'm based in Perth. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about microprofile GraphQL um, spec and give an example of using it with uh, Helidon and Coherence. So we'll go through that. A bit about myself, um, been in IT for a, a little while. Um, started as a software developer writing C in progress in 1991 on SCO Unix when one megabyte of RAM was a lot so to run 100 users so that was pretty awesome back then. Um, got extensive experience with coherence, Java, JavaScript, DevOps, WebLogic server as well as uh, quite a few years with as a DBA. Um, I currently work in the coherence development team who are mostly in Boston and US based so I'm down here in Perth. Um, I worked on a fair few of the core product features in coherence and this is not a coherence talk, but just giving you a bit of an overview. Um, in mostly in the management and monitoring side of things with Visual VM and Grafana and JMX. Also been involved in a number of open source projects out there. Um, and most recently worked on the MicroProfile GraphQL implementation. So that's what we're gonna be talking about today. So I'm gonna do a high level overview of uh, the GraphQL spec. Um, I'm not going to explain GraphQL as such, so hopefully people have enough knowledge of that to hopefully move, you know, get, get the, the gist. Um, so look at the spec, we'll have a look at an example of the schema generation, then I'll just outline a higher level support that Helidon, our microservices framework has for the microprofile GraphQL, and then do a demonstration. So probably four or five minutes of slides and then mostly code. So the MicroProfile GraphQL spec, um, the intent of it, and the URL is there, is to provide a code first set of APIs that enables users quickly to develop portable GraphQL based applications in Java. So out of the spec, there are two main requirements. Firstly, that you generate and make the GraphQL schema available. And that's done by looking for annotations in the user's code. And you need to include, it includes the GraphQL queries, mutations, as well as all entities that are defined explicitly or used as parameters to those um, queries or mutations. It's also the second thing is you actually must execute the requests. So it's not good enough just to create the schema, but be able to execute those requests and they'll be in the form of a query or mutation. So um, at the moment it supports uh, HTTP and at the moment, the this version, first version of the spec doesn't support subscriptions, but they're looking at uh, adding that as we go. So in terms of um, the specification, um, so it's a code first approach. So it's about annotating your classes that, and automatically generating your schema and your queries and your mutations. So the main set of annotations defined, uh, first one is a GraphQL API annotation. And that's a marker annotation that identifies a CDI bean as a GraphQL endpoint. Then we have two other main annotations, the query, which basically says it applies to a public method um, that allows you to ask for specific fields or on an object or a collection of objects. And of course, those queries must be in a, a class with a GraphQL API annotation. And then the mutation is the same, so it applies to public methods which allow users to create or mutate entries. And of course that also needs to be included in a GraphQL API annotated class. Um, there's another, there's a number of other related annotations. Um, you can actually annotate a type, you can call it a type and that will generate a, a type for you, an output type. Um, but you don't necessarily have to do that. And in an example, I won't do that because it'll implicitly pick it up. But if you want to do that, that's possible. Um, input also defines a, a complex type is an input type interface that's fairly um, straightforward. Um, there's also some other ones, including formatting. So JSON B date and number formats and uh, generic date and number formats. So you can define a format for dates, numbers, um, and they could also be locale based as well. Um, you've got also some default values, which I'll talk about, enums, names and descriptions so that we can uh, describe our, our schema. So here's an example here. So we've got our contact GraphQL API class. So we've got that as a CDI bean application scoped and we've annotated it with our GraphQL API annotation. 
and we're injecting some you know, fictitious customer service that we're working with. So what we've got here, we've got a query. So we've got our, our get customers, which returns a collection of customer objects. And we've annotated that with get with the query and we're returning that from our fictitious service. We've also then got a, another one which return, finds a customer. So get a customer based upon a customer ID. And in this one here, we're actually changing the name. So by default, if you have a query with no, no name here, then it will just remove the get and create it as customers. So just removing the getter. And here you can actually say, I want to call this fine a customer. Um, it sends a parameter in as well. So if you're familiar with, you know, doing, you know, a, you know annotation scanning and things like that, if the reason we recommend using uh, the name parameter is because if you don't, I can't remember the, the compiler option, but you'll get arg0, arg1, and arg2, et cetera, as the names of the parameters, which aren't really useful. So that's why we sort of recommend doing that. And then we've got a mutation, which, you know, returns a customer. Um, again, we pass in a customer ID. We give it a name. We also, you know, apply some non-null annotations and then we return that. So we can see on the right here, the generated schema here. So it will, uh, it will generate that type because it's used as a part of a return type. It will also then create the two queries. So we've got a query called customers. So it's actually removed the get, and this is the way the spec works, um, and then gives you the customer camel case style. And then we've got to find a customer, which passes a customer ID. And you notice you know, the exclamation mark there, meaning it's a mandatory um, parameter. Then the way the GraphQL spec works is that if you have a primitive like int float, for example, they will be automatically marked as mandatory. But if you have anything else, object or any you know, string, whatever, that will be um, marked as non-mandatory. And so you can see here that name, name is mandatory, but uh, yeah, in here, I've got an example here, but so you can actually change that and you can change the behavior with that as well. So at the moment, um, there are five implementations of the GraphQL spec. So um, there's obviously the, the Small Ray, Liberty, Quarkus, Wildfly, and Helidon, which is what I'll be talking about. So I'm just going to get a very quick overview of Helidon, and then we'll get into writing some code. So Helidon is Oracle's uh, microprofile platform, so a set of libraries for developing microservices. Um, it's at Helidon.io. The name Helidon actually means swallow, so the a bird which is small and fast, so that's where I've sort of got that from. We've also got, uh, it's under open source under Apache 2.0. It's built on Netty. Um, there's lots of APIs there, REST, health, metrics, tracing, and also has Graal VM native image support. So it allows you to compile and create a, a native image to run very quickly. And this is very high level here, but effectively we've got Netty that runs underneath and we've got a reactive component called Helidon SE and we've got our micro profile on top of that as well. So with, with, the, with the GraphQL, we actually can provide some support in here, but the main support is in micro profile. So I think the micro profile version is like 4.0, I think at the moment. So we, we're on our way to supporting that. Um, micro profile 3.3. Um, so in Helidon, we have all the, the standard config metrics, tracing all of the standard 3.3 uh, profile there. Um, we also have the Jakarta, CDI, persistence, and so on. And then we have Helidon specific components. So being the microprofile GraphQL, which we're going to talk about, plus also cores, module, and a gRPC, which is quite a nifty one. So server and client that we actually use in the coherence team as well. So that's, again, a very high level of uh, Helidon. Now, what I'm going to do after the next slide, we're going to go in and I'm going to create a I'm going to expose my coherence application um, with some GraphQL APIs. And just so you have a quick two minute view of what coherence is, uh, it's a leading in memory data grid. It's basically a fast key value store with optional disk persistence. So if you think of a, a hash map on steroids plus a lot more, um, that's what coherence is. So being able to store, we can store data across multiple servers. It's automatically sharded or balanced across for high availability and reliability and scalability. We have um, 
multiple APIs to get into it. Obviously, GraphQL, REST, Java, C++, Native, .NET, and gRPC and JavaScript. So as I said, it, a lot of people use it for caching, but of course, it, it's more than a cache. It can be used for querying, transactions, and eventing, and so on in place distributed processing. So if you think of typical applications where you get information from your store, whether it's the map or a cache store, you can then um, work on that and then send it back. But the, the best way is to basically send your processing to where the data is. So like by lambdas and things like that. We've also got refreshes from databases and multi-site replication, scalable durable messaging, supports Docker, Kubernetes, open tracing, Grafana, and, and a lot more as well. So that's just a quick two minute overview of Cahoon so you can have a bit of understand what we're talking about. So now enough, enough with the PowerPoints, um, let's move on to um, going in some code. So what I'm gonna do is I've got Cahoon application, which I'm gonna add GraphQL endpoints to. So let me just move into the uh, IDE here. So I've got my IDE here and I've got a standard, uh, just a POM here. I'm including the Heldedon bill of materials here, and I'm using the CDI component, and I'm also bringing in the coherence of CDI. So this is using the, the community edition support here. Um, I've got a couple of uh, classes. So I've got a customer class here uh, with customer ID and some attributes. I've also got an order, which is for a customer, has an order ID and a customer ID and includes a collection of order lines. And there's the order line itself as well. So I'll just go into the bootstrap. So I'm going to run this application up and effectively I'm in I'm injecting two named maps. And you can think of them as a map, but of course it's it's coherence's named map implementation, but we implement the map interface so it's easy to sort of to work with. So we've got one one named map holding our customers and one named map holding our orders. So if I just, let's just uh, run that so we can see that it's just running the application. And at the moment, all it's doing is it's starting up coherence. And you can see here, we've got some products and orders and I'm putting some customers in and then putting some random orders in. So you can see I've started it up and I've got these uh, information. I'm just outputting those. I've got my customers and orders. So that's our, our mock coherence application that we're running. But the back end could be anything. Yeah, it could be a Postgres, could be whatever you want. So now what I'll do is let's start off and um, create an API for this. So I'm gonna create a new Java class. So actually let me do this first because it won't work without this, of course. So if we wanna include the Helidon micro profile implementation, oops, that's not what I wanted to do there. So I just include Helidon micro profile GraphQL server. And uh, what I've also done too here is I've, within my index, I'm just using good old graphical. So I've just brought graphical in and I'm exposing that on an endpoint so we can work with it and just pointing it to the GraphQL endpoint that we're gonna generate. So let's first create a API called custom API. So I'm gonna make this, I hope this, this is okay, the size. So I'm gonna make it, um, application scoped, and I'm going to also annotate it with the GraphQL API annotation. So remember this one says that this class is going to contain queries and mutations. So the first thing I want to do is just to inject these named maps in here so I can use them. The first thing I'll do is let's use the query annotation. So just use query and create a, a method. So I'm gonna return a collection of customers. So I'm gonna say get customer. So I'm gonna to, going to create um, a query to return all the customers in the in our um, coherence name map. And I'm gonna return customers.values. So this is, if this is just running on a single um, machine, but if it was running across multiple servers, that could be scaled out across hundreds of services is what uh, Cahoot sort of does. So once I, so it's as simple as creating the API, uh, annotating the GraphQL API, then annotating with the query. So once this starts, there's a couple of things we can see here. So we can see that it's now found 
an associated GraphQL API class and Heladon started up with these extra, extra features here. So the first part of the spec is that you need to actually expose your GraphQL schema at this, you know, GraphQL slash schema dot GraphQL. So if I do a curl to that, we can see that it's created our query called customer. So it's just remember it's got rid of the get and it's got customers, which returns a collection or array of customer. And because that's implicitly used, it's also introspected that type and it's created the type for us there. So if we then, let's go into graphical and well, I've got that exposed on the UI endpoint here. So we now can see we've got the query here and we can see the same thing we saw in there. So let's just uh, run our query and say customer. I think of course I should call this customers, but anyway, it doesn't matter. So customer ID, name, balance, email and address. I'll fix that up in the next one. So now I've just run that and I could, oops, I've run that and it's now returning the information from the cache. So what it's done is it's automatically created a schema, but also wired that together. So if you've worked with GraphQL behind the scenes, you know, there's data fetches and, and field definitions and all those sort of things. So it's automatically created that and wired up the fact that we can return that collection it's and re, you know call this get customer so we've got that working fine so let's look at the balance here so we've got balances um, a float so let's change that to be a little bit more uh, formatted so we can provide number formats so let's actually change that to get customers which makes more sense there so if we look at the customer object what we can do is one of the annotations, and I'll just grab this from here to save typing. We've got a number format annotation. So what I can do is I can go on here and say, well, let's apply this annotation to the balance. And I'll actually do it on the get balance because that's what we want here. So. So if you apply any of these annotations, so the number format, if you apply it to the get, the getter, then it applies to the output type. So whatever you're returning, if you apply it to the setter, it will apply to an input type. And if you apply it to the attribute, it will apply to both of them. So if I just restart that now, so that pretty much for all of the annotations that works the way. So if you apply it to the, um, the attribute, it applies to both input and output types and the set and the getter apply to the input and the output type respectively. So if we just re refresh that now, and we've got fix up our customers here, here we go. So if you look at the query now, we've got customer and you can see that now we've got a, a format on that. So that adds the format, but also adds a, um, a description on it. So once I run that now, we can see we've got that nicely formatted as well. So next let's um, go in into our API and let's add another query and we'll use this one to get a collection of order objects. So we're gonna return, so we're gonna return orders. And again, we're going to return the orders map and get the values. And this time let's, let's change this. So find all orders. So we can override this by providing a query an uh, attribute, sorry, and a parameter to this, or you can also use the name attribute or name annotation as well. So I'll run that one. Refresh that. So now we've got a second query, which is find all orders and that returns order and order lines. And if we take a quick look at the, um, the schema now, you can see that it's got the customer, of course, it's got the order and the order line because they've been part of the, the order is part of an order line. So it'll do the object graphs. We've got the new query and we've also added a couple of uh, scalars in by default. So scalars are additional types. So if I did, excuse me, if I name this, so I'm going to create another, a query called um, find customers and use my find find orders, I mean, find orders, 
and we're going to find all orders. And what can we find from that? Let's get that out of the way. So order ID, order date, order total, and the customer ID, and the order lines. So we know the order lines is an, is an attribute, so um, an object or a type. So it's asking me for that. So now our line number, item count, product description, cost per item and total, order line total. So very quickly, we've now exposed uh, to find all orders. So let's, uh, let's fix up this as well, like we did before. So let's go into our number format and you could use JSON B. If you're using JSON B number format, you can use that as well. So if we go to the order, let's have a look at some of the things we wanna be formatting. So if we um, get the order total, okay, so we wanna format that nicely and then look at the order line. Then we wanna do get the cost per item. So that's something we wanna format um, and also, the order, order line total. So remember, if I put it on the get, it applies to the output. And if I put it on the set, it applies to the input. So I'll, I'll run that again. So I go back in here, refresh that, wait for it to refresh. So now if we look at the query here, and we run the fine orders again, you can see that's nicely formatted for us too. So if you, if you wanted to ask users to provide input formatted like this, then you would put it on the, the set method and then it would require them to enter the, um, the data in that sort of format. Um, next, well, we, it's nice we can we see the customer ID, but let's, it'd be nice to be able to actually ask for some attributes of the customer as well. So. Let's go back to this here. Um, we're going to say, if we look at a customer, uh, so we look at the order. So we've got the order and we know we've got the customer ID. So what we're gonna do is just do a coherence uh, join. Basically, we're going to bring in the customer map. So what we're doing here is we're just saying, make this injectable. And when this is deserialized, it's going to inject our map into it so we can then query. So we've got that there and I can just create, say public customer, get customer. So now this time I'm gonna return from the customers map. I'm gonna get the customer matching the customer ID we have. And I'm gonna run that now. So this is not GraphQL, but this is just how I'm joining joining up. But just to show you, if we re-query that now, once that I'm too quick for the server. So if we look at query now, the order, we've now got this customer. So I can go into here and say, well, I'm interested in, in um, oops, sorry, in order. Rather than just customer ID, I'm interested in customer and what am I interested in? Let's get the name and the email. So find orders. So now you can see we've got the order ID and the name and the email. And one of the great things obviously from GraphQL is if you wanted to not even include that, then you're not gonna get that information. It's not gonna do this call to get it from the cache or from the named map for you. So that's one of the, you know, the advantages of obviously GraphQL in general is you can choose what you want and it won't get this unless you ask for it. So that's great. Um, now I'll just go and uh, create a couple of uh, mutations. So just to save time, let's create do a create customer. So let's allow the users to create a customer through this customer API. So what we do is we include the mutation annotation on there. And again, I'm gonna give it a name because we know we don't want it to be called arg0. So a mutation, it's gonna take in a customer object. And all I'm doing here is I'm just saying, okay, well, if the customer contains a key that you're looking at, so it already exists, then we want to throw an exception. And this is one of the things in terms of the spec, the, the MP GraphQL spec, 
it says in terms of exceptions, the way it works is that unchecked exceptions, by default, the messages are hidden and it will return server error. So it's sort of like by default, uh, protecting you, uh, protecting sensitive information from the server. But in this case here, I'm just going to show you an example of where we can override that. So a legal argument exception is an unchecked exception. So it doesn't display the message. A checked exception it does. And I'll show you that in a moment. But you can override that. So here I'm saying I want to override it and say, allow the illegal argument exception, <clears throat> excuse me, to display the message from the legal argument exception to be displayed. So that's just what they're doing there. Then I'm going to put that customer in and then just return the details for you. Just one moment. Okay, <clears throat> that gives me enough time to refresh that. So let's go back here, refresh our schema. We now have a mutation. So now we can see we've got a create customer and it creates a customer input. So if we have a look at the schema again, <clears throat> we can see that because um, customer has been used as an input, you know, a parameter, it automatically creates a customer input type. So we've got customer and we've got the customer input type. So that's all automatically created for us. So if we said, okay, well, what do you want to do now? We want to have a mutation, create a customer. Right, let's get a bit more room here. So create customer, what does that take in? It takes a customer object in. And what is customer object? So customer ID, number one, the name, Tim, and the balance zero. So let me just give you a bit of room here. So create customer and that returns a customer. So let me just, um, so we don't have to keep typing stuff, let me just include a couple of fragments here. I love fragments, they're just so useful. Saves typing and mistyping. So I've got a fragment for customer and a fragment for orders. So let me just change this. So I'm going to return a, my query is going to return a customer fragment and my orders is going to turn an order fragment and my create customer is returning a customer. So customer fragment there. So let me go and try and create a customer. Oh, I think I did this, did this before. Ah, I didn't add the orders. Ah, okay. That's all right. So yeah, I went ahead a, a step ahead of myself. So I'll just remove that off for the moment. So if I try and create a customer, it tells me customer one already exists. So that's my uh, legal argument exception happening. So I'm going to do create a customer 100 and create a customer and I've got my customer there. So one of the interesting things, if you look at the customer input, so remember I said the spec says that if you have a type which is a primitive, then it's gonna be mandatory like a float and, or an int, but anything else is non-mandatory. So the name actually is non-mandatory. So I could leave that off and create a customer, another customer with a null name. So that's not really a great idea. So let's go and fix that up. So if we go back here, we'll go to our customer object and I'm going to put another annotation. So I'm gonna put an annotation on name. So I'm gonna call this non-null. So because it's a string, it's not a, not a primitive, it can be nullable. So I'm applying the non-null to the attribute, which means for the input and the output, it will be um, non-null. So I'll restart that again. How are we going for time there, Paul? What's what's the sort of the time marker? No, you're all good to continue. Okay, cool. No worries. So I've re I've basically added the non-null on there, and if I refresh this, you'll see that it's now graphical's complaining because it's like, hey, the name must be provided because now if you look at the mutation here, the custom input name is actually mandatory. So 
we must put the name on there. So you can you can specify things that need to be mandatory. Now, one of the things we'll do now is um, let me just, if we look at the find um, customers, it'll be nice again. So on the order I put, let's find the order, let's find the customer for that order. Well, let's sort of mix that around a bit and say, I'm interested in when I get a uh, customer, I want to find all the orders. So let's go into here, we're going to inject this named map into our customer. So I'm just going to make that injectable. This is the coherence thing. I'm going to insert that in. And now what I'm going to do is say, well, I want to return our collection of order and order and I'll get orders. So I'm return a collection of orders for this customer. So remember the orders map contains the, the orders for all customers. So we need to return orders, but we want to return the values, but we want to apply a filter to this. So we're going an equals filter and I'll use a, a method reference here, get customer ID and I'm going to return customer ID. So I'm basically getting all orders that match this customer ID. So I'll restart that one. And come back here, refresh that. Now, if we look on customer, on the query of customer, now I've got orders. So I can go in here and say, well, oops, that's not the, that's the fragment. So let me actually include that now. So on the frag, customer fragment, I can say orders. So now, whenever I get a customer, I would look at the orders and I'm interested in the order ID, the date perhaps, and the order, the order total. So if I now run my query on customers, we can now see we've got Billy Joel has these orders and so on. So it's very, very easy to do that and join that. And anything within your method, method call um, or within your, your object returning, I'm just basically you returning a collection of orders and that get will then turn into a, um, a, a, a field definition and then returned. So finally, I'll just add in a couple of mutations. So I'll just do these two mutations and then I'll open up for a few questions. So I'm going to create two mutations now just to, to show a couple other features. Um, let's bring that in. So I'm going to, I have an, uh, excuse me, I have a mutation to create an order. That's going to take a customer in and an order ID. And if the customer named map already contains that customer, I'm going to throw an exception. And this is a checked exception. So by default, GraphQL will display that message for us. And if the order already exists, so already, if the order already exists, then we will throw an exception as well. Otherwise we'll create it. So let's restart that. And let me just bring in, bring in this for the sake of time. I'll create an order. So I'll refresh that. Let's have a look. So I'm going to create an order. So I'm going to create, create my new customer again, my 1001 customer. So if I try and create an order without, with an invalid customer ID, then it gives me that message. So that's the message from the checked exception. So by default, that will be displayed. So let's actually put a proper customer number in there. So that should pass. And then now it's hitting the other check that I've done, which is order or exists. So that's the um, unchecked exception here. And let's create a new order called 1001. So there's my create order. Now that's returned. The last thing we'll do is let's add a line item to that order. So add line. So we'll bring that up and it gives a bit more room. Now, interestingly enough, we can see that it's complaining. It's saying that 
item count is required. Okay, so if we look at the mutation and we add order line to order, then it takes an order line input. And of course, the, um, the item count is mandatory. So what we can do is we can go in and we want to default that to a value. So if we go into here and say, well, okay, let's go into um, the order lines and say, and is the line number, was it, that we it was complaining about? No, is it the item count? So if we go in here and say, well, I want to provide a default value for item count. So I just go use the default value and say one. So because I've got this in the set operation, uh, sorry, the set method, then it's going to apply to the input type, not the output type. Or, and if you had on the output type and you didn't have a value, then it would be defaulted to one. So if we then refresh that, we now see that it's no longer complaining about that. So if we go into the mutation, we can see that the order line input now has a default of one. Now the defaults are very sophisticated. You can default dates. You can use JSON as a default if you have um, if the requirement as well too. So then if I go here, I can create my customer number, create my customer, oops, I'm gonna leave a bit of screen real estate here, customer number 101. Then I'm gonna create my order and then I'm going to add an order line to it as well. Oh, okay, that's good. My validation's working, that's great. Add a line to that. And now we can see we've got a new order with a new order line for a iPhone 12, which is pretty expensive there. Um, but yeah, so that's sort of what I had to show. Um, I'll just bring it back to here. Um, any are there any questions from anyone? Um, hopefully that gives you a bit of an idea of the spec itself, um, how Helidon has implemented it, and just an example of using coherence behind the scenes, but you could use any backend um, data source that you wanted. Looks great. Yeah, looks really interesting. Yeah, cool, thanks. And it's a very, and, so, and it, it, is the, it is a code first approach. So there's other things like um, they're gonna be talked about later, which is sort of different, but this is, you know, if you want to use a code first approach, then yeah, you've got the option to use this. Mm. Yeah, great. We'll definitely look cool. into it. No worries. Uh, any other questions? All right. Um, so yeah, feel free to post anything and um, any questions. Um, here's a bit more information on the, the GraphQL um, spec and I think we'll we'll post up the, the PowerPoint anyway or the PDF of the PowerPoint won't we Paul yeah just uh send us a uh, once you've uh, generated the PDF uh yeah by all yep. means like attached to the uh, to the GitHub issue and more than happy to uh, to retweet that out okay sweet um and so Helidon's there coherence and the graphical so with that um thanks for listening and I'll hand you back to Paul <laughs>